and welcome to In Their Own Words, the story of the American experiment in the words of the people who made it happen. Hi, I'm your host, Pete Fenzel, and we're really delighted that you chose to spend some time with us today. We've got a great episode today. It's about the shot that was heard around the world, the spark that ignited the American Revolutionary War, and some stories about the characters who played a big role um, in the 24-hour period around the 19th of April in 1775. It starts with the appointment of General Thomas Gage as the overall commander of the British forces in North America back in 1774. Well, Gage had been here for a long time during the French and Indian War, and he actually married a girl from New Jersey, Margaret Kemble, who became Margaret Kemble Gage, and lived for a long time in New York. As a, as a British officer. But he went back to England and was appointed by the government to come back to America to capture the leaders of the rebellious factions and to force the American colonists into submission to the whim and will of the British Crown and their overlords in Parliament. He knew, based upon his familiarity with Americans, that he was not about to crush the American spirit of resistance. He, he, he knew Americans pretty darn well. According to Gage, the best course of action to take is to disarm them so that they would not be able to oppose British might when the iron fist came down hard on them and they would be compelled to cease their resistance to uh, British policy. And the Americans knew likewise that if they ever were disarmed by the British, that this wasn't just a loss of expensive military hardware, it wasn't just a loss of gunpowder and, and, and arms, it was a loss of their liberties because they knew they would be utterly vulnerable to whatever measures the British would take against them. So in September of 1774, Gage undertook a very surreptitious action against the gunpowder stores in Somerville, Massachusetts, and he successfully removed all the powder, but it raised a tremendous hue and cry among the people in Massachusetts at the time because they understood that this was the beginning of the end of their freedom if this was allowed to continue. Then he did, he did it a second time. He ordered the Navy to go up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire to Fort William and Mary and remove a substantial supply of military stores there before it fell into the hands of the Americans. Dr. Joseph Warren, who was one of the heads of the Sons of Liberty and of the Committee of uh, Safety in Boston, found out about this through his intelligence network and sent his best express writer, Paul Revere, up to New Hampshire to warn the Minutemen up there that this was about to happen at Portsmouth. Well, the Minutemen gathered in numbers of, of several hundred and took over the fort, removed the military stores a day or so before the British Navy showed up and leaving only the very heavy cannon that they could not remove and then distributed all the military stores they had taken from Fort William and Mary to all the different towns up in New Hampshire. Well, that chastised Gage for a while, and he had to refine his thinking a little bit and, and make things a little bit more secret than before. Until April of 1775, when he hatched a scheme to seize and destroy the substantial stockpile of military stores held by the uh, colony in uh, Concord, Massachusetts, about 18 miles west of Boston. Again, Dr. Warren found out about this plan, perhaps in, in part from intelligence gathered from Gage's wife, Margaret, the New Jersey girl who uh, was married to General Gage and who may have been a spy for the Americans, according to more recent scholarship. Well, in, however he got the information, on the night of April 18th, Tuesday night the 18th, he called William Dawes, one of his express riders, and sent him out to, to Lexington to let Sam Adams and John Hancock know that there, were, there was big action afoot and that some of that action might be directed against them. Then about an hour later, he had gotten an additional intelligence with much more detail and he called Paul Revere, his best express rider, to come to his house uh, and Revere did that around 10 o'clock at night. And he told Revere about the expedition of 700 redcoats that were going to go to destroy the munitions in Concord. And he was also told to uh, warn both Hancock and Adams that they might be targets of the expedition as well. Paul Revere had been 
a member of a group of express riders who called themselves the mechanics. And the previous Sunday, they had set up a signal system that if the Brit British were going to go through Boston Neck, the land route up to Concord, because they had suspected that something was up, they would put one lantern in the steeple of the Old North Church to let the uh, Minutemen know that this was the direction the British troops were going to take. If the British were going to row their men across the Charles River up to uh, Cambridge, however, they would put two lanterns in to let them know that it was the more northern route that the, and shorter route, as a matter of fact, that the Redcoats would take if they were going out to, to Concord. Now, now, this system of warning with one lantern or two lanterns became extremely famous in a poem written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow about Paul Revere's ride. And this is how we learned as children about the Revolutionary War. And, and so let's just listen to the first couple of stanzas of Paul Revere's ride. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April of 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light. One if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. And he goes on for many other stanzas, and you can hear in the cadence of the poem almost the hoofbeats of Deacon Larkin's horse as uh, Paul Revere rode to his midnight ride. It's a great poem. It's a better poem than it is history, however, so let's resume our narrative about Paul Revere's ride. That night, two lanterns hung in the steeple, and Paul Revere was rowed across Boston Harbor under the guns of the warship, the Somerset, over to Charlestown, where he met with other Sons of Liberty in Charlestown. He was loaned a horse by Deacon John Larkin for his ride to go warn the, the people in Lexington and Concord of the, of the approach of the British troops. And he was also warned that there were many patrols, British patrols, along the road leading to Lexington and Concord. Revere arrived in Lexington about 12.30 at night and uh, went to Reverend Clark's house to let Sam Adams and John Hancock know that they might be the targets of the British advance. He was met there about a half an hour late, around one o'clock, by William Dawes with the same message that had been sent by Dr. Warren. Well, the two fellows, after having given the alarm, refreshed themselves for about a half an hour, and, about, and at about 1.30, again, took off in the direction of Concord to go warn the Minutemen there of the approach of the British troops. Just a short while after they left Lexington en route to Concord, they encountered a young fellow, a 24-year-old doctor named Samuel Prescott, who was also a member of the Sons of Liberty and a leading patriot in the town of Concord. Dr. Prescott said to Revere and to Dawes that he lived in Concord and that he knew everybody there and it would be far more effective if he went with them to help warn the people of the approaching column so that they could remove all of the military stores at Concord. And so they agreed, and they did, and the three took off together. Only about two and a half miles outside of Lexington, a very large British patrol captured all three of them. But Dr. Prescott, being a young man and a, and a great horseman, jumped over a stone wall and made his escape, and made it up to Concord, and, and raised the alarm both in, Con in Concord and in Acton to get the Minutemen out and the alarm spread out further from there. It was kind of like a telephone tree type of, of system that had been established in advance that when your town was alarmed that you would send messages out to others. And so hundreds of Minutemen started gathering in the wee hours of that morning. Meanwhile, William Dawes also made an escape by riding up to another house and shouting out, well boys, I brought you two of them. And the Redcoats fearing that they were gonna be the targets of an attack themselves, they rode away because of the great bluff by William Dawes. Revere, however, was kept in custody at that point in time until gunfire started erupting all over the neighborhoods. And this gunfire was the alarm that was given to all the different towns for all the Minutemen to start gathering because there was something afoot. 
The Redcoats who had stopped Paul Revere heard of this and Revere told them, well, you, you guys are in a bad way because now you're going to have hundreds and hundreds of men converging upon Lexington and Concord and uh, you're going to be right in the middle of it. So the Redcoats took Revere's horse and skedaddled out of town and go back east where they connected with the oncoming column of 700 British troops. Meanwhile, the Minutemen of Concord and Acton were, were gathering along the heights to the, to the west of Concord. The military stores were removed, leaving only some wooden gun carriages and not much else for the British to find. At around 5 o'clock or 5.30 in the morning of the 19th, Wednesday the 19th of April, Captain Parker brought all of the Minutemen from Lexington out of the, the tavern and uh, brought them onto Lexington Green to await the arrival of the British troops. And sure enough, around dawn, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith and his adjutant, Major John Pitcairn, along with 700 British troops, approached Lexington Green. And so now, let's go on a field trip to Lexington Green and pick up the story from there. We're now here on the Battle Green at Lexington, also known as Lexington Common. And this is the spot where Captain John Parker and his 77 Minutemen stood in two ranks to oppose the advance of the British forces on the morning of April 19 of 1775. The men were over here in Buckman's Tavern just to our left. After Paul Revere and William Dawes had arrived here, gunshots rang out as an alarm to all of the Minutemen to gather here at the Common. Captain Parker brought his men over to the tavern and uh, gave them their instructions. And around 5.30 they came up right over here to this spot and they, the 77 men formed two lines. And they were told, as you can see on the inscription of this marker stone, in uh, the basic words was, men, keep, hold your ground and don't fire unless you're fired upon. But if they mean to start a war, let it start here. These guys were under strict orders and they were also outnumbered 10 to 1 by the 700 or so Redcoats that were coming up Massachusetts Avenue from, from the east. And they were not about to pick a fight in t with 10 to 1 odds. So they grounded their, the socks of their weapons and stood here in defiance of the British government by sending 700 troops against them. Well, despite the orders, not to fire somewhere here, a shot rang out. Whether it came from one of the houses is unlikely. It did not come from the Minutemen, but there's testimony from about 35 men who witnessed the battle that they could see a puff of smoke at the British line uh, after they heard the shot. And their, their attention was drawn in that direction by the report of the gun. It sounded like a pistol shot, somebody said. Well, as soon as that shot was heard, several British soldiers opened fire and killed a few Minutemen. Then more Redcoats opened up and a volley of fire killed the rest. We, we lost eight men dead here and we lost ten wounded. Parker, before the, the volley was fired, had figured that they had made enough of a demonstration of defiance and he had ordered the men to withdraw in orderly fashion. Captain Parker had tuberculosis and he couldn't shout. So some of the men started withdrawing, some of the men didn't. The, the Redcoats opened up, killed eight, wounded ten. The, the men took off to, uh, to escape the onslaught. And the British column was led by Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith and his adjutant was Major John Pitcairn, who later would die at Bunker Hill. And he came out here waving a sword on his horse, cursing the men standing here, and telling him to disperse. Well, they were not, he was not terribly impressive in the minds of the brave men who stood here, and of also the brave men who died here. So, I'm going to show this, I'm going to swivel the camera around, I'll show you Buckman's Tavern right there, I'll show you the route down Mass Ave from which the Redcoats were coming. There's an obelisk over here on the other side, on, on the... Uh, I guess it's the western side of the common here where the, the eight men who died here are now interred. They were originally buried in the, original, in the old graveyard here, but uh, they set up a marker and buried them there in 1835. And now until Judgment Day, that's where their remains will stay. This 
yellow building over here is Buckman's Tavern, and that around 5 30 in the morning is where the, the uh, Minutemen all gathered to get their instructions and to refresh themselves and probably have a good solid breakfast before they headed out to battle. A little bit to the right of Buckman's Tavern, that's Massachusetts Avenue. And that's the direction from which the Redcoats advanced. And I think you can see just to the right of this big tree here, the statue, the back of the statue of the Minuteman uh, at the corner there of Bedford and Mass Ave. Here's the obelisk where the eight men who died here that morning are, are now buried. And now we're going to go down uh, Mass Ave to, to, uh, to Concord and continue from there. That's it from here in Lexington. By 7 o'clock in the morning, the Redcoats had reached Concord. And of the 700 men commanded by Colonel Smith, he sent about 200 men up here to the, to the Old North Bridge. This spot marks the place where the first engagement occurred where the Minuteman stood about three hours thereafter. They were up on these heights gathering all morning after they heard the alarm from both Do Dr. Prescott and from the shots out of Lexington. And about 400 Minutemen gathered here in the morning of the 19th. They were commanded by uh, John Buttrick, who, who uh, was a local Concordman, and the best unit of Minutemen from this area was the, from the next town of Acton, commanded by Isaac Davis, who was around 30 years old, married with four little kids, two boys and two girls. He had uh, the great affection for his Minutemen company because he trained them mercilessly, and he, he let them know that being well trained and well equipped was the best way that they were going to survive a fight with the Redcoats when the fight came. And so he was a gunsmith and he made the best weapons for them. He made bayonets that fitted onto those weapons. He also set up a shooting range in his backyard in Acton for the company to come over and practice their marksmanship so that they would be prepared for battle when the time came. And the time came on the morning of the 19th of April. And so the Acton men uh, were given the honor of leading the 400 uh, minute men coming down here to approach the bridge. They were content to stay on the hill for a little while to see what was going to happen with these redcoats milling around on the other side of the bridge. But then they saw smoke around 10 o'clock or so coming up from Concord and they thought that the British were putting fire to the town and that they could not tolerate that. So the men came down the hill and came right over here and assembled right here. It didn't take very long before a few redcoats opened fire. The first bullets fired killed Isaac Davis and another fellow from Acton. Then the British opened up with an entire volley coming from them. And then Major Butterick comes down here screaming, fire boys for God's sakes, fire, fire. And then they opened up with everything they had and killed three redcoats over there, wounded a, a bunch of them, and then sent them running for their lives uh, down the road to the rest of the British troops down in Concord. Well, the men here pursued them, and th thus began the great retreat of the British force all the way to Boston. This statue was intended to replicate as best as we knew how Isaac Davis looked on that morning. Uh, the sculptor went and took photographs of his descendants and recognized different family features in their faces. And so the face of the statue is, is the best that we can guess at how Isaac Davis looked on that morning. And th that's pretty much the clothing that he wore. And so that statue is, is a tribute, not just to Isaac Davis, but to all these incredible people who came down here out of their homes to risk life and limb for the sake of liberty. Now I'm going to show you the bridge now. I'm going to turn the camera around. And we're going to go take a look at the bridge. You can see how the bridge is arched, and the Redcoats could stand on the other side of the bridge fairly covered and could still open fire on the Minutemen over here. Once the Redcoats started to withdraw, the Minutemen advanced, and uh, there's still uh, graves of, uh, of a few Redcoats who died here uh, right next to that obelisk over there. This monument commemorating the battle here on April 19th of 1775 was erected uh, in 1836 and dedicated on the 4th of July of 1837. 
uh, the, the poet laureate of Concord, Ralph Waldo Emerson, wrote a poem for the occasion, which we know as the Concord Hymn. And the first stanza is engraved on the base of the statue of the Minuteman on the other side of the bridge. You've all heard this before, but it bears repeating. And I'll give it to you right now. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. The foe long since in silence slept, alike the conqueror silent sleeps, and time the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. On this green bank, by this soft stream, we set today a votive stone that memory may their deeds redeem when, like our sires, our sons are gone. Spirit that made those heroes dare to die and leave their children free, bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. After the British began their retreat about 10.30 in the morning, a large number of Minutemen gathered at Miriam's Corner, just about a mile down the road, and fought the British there in a, in, a, in a bloody engagement. This started a running battle that lasted all the way into Charlestown for the next six hours. Now, Captain Parker of Lexington, even though they had lost eight men killed and ten men wounded, met again in Buckman's Tavern to decide what they were going to do for the rest of the day. And so they marched out about two and a half miles west of Lexington to take up an ambush position themselves. And so let's take a field trip out to what's called now Parker's Revenge. At about 1.30 in the afternoon of Wednesday, April 19th, Captain Parker and a large group of the men from the, from the Lexington Green came to this location on the border between Lexington and the town of Lincoln. The hillock up there behind me is called Parker's Revenge. And this was the spot in the early afternoon where the Lexington Minutemen ambushed the Redcoats retreating from Concord. We're only about two and a half miles or so from Lexington Green. And the style of fighting that was used was called a circle of fire, where units would pick ambush sites, put a volley or two into the redcoats, then disappear into the forest, and then circle down road a bit to set up another ambush site. And they usually would go around another unit that had already picked their spots so that they would leapfrog and maintain a continuous fire upon the redcoats. Now, archeological digs occurred here, and they found exactly where the British bullets were landing up on that distant hillock up there. It wasn't here at this outcropping. It was all the way back there so that the Redcoats would have to go a distance. The men were facing basically this way and the Redcoats uh, flankers were coming up the hill over a little bit to the left and up. But they never made it there because they, they are the ones who took the most fire. And the Minutemen from Lexington under Captain Parker got their revenge for the murders on Lexington Green right here at about 1.30 o'clock in the afternoon. Now I'm going to flip the camera around and show you Battle Road, which is the actual remnant of the road that the Redcoats took in their retreat from Concord. Okay, we are now at the top of the hill of Parker's Revenge, looking down to the Battle Road, which is that pale line that you can see going across. That's where the red coat column was coming across, heading to the, to the east uh, after the retreat from Concord. The red coat flankers were coming down this way to try to attack up here. Our men fired into them and inflicted some severe casualties at that point. And then they just dispersed into the wood, circled back, heading to the east to leapfrog over other men and men who had taken up ambush positions and then taken up new positions closer to Lexington. And that's how Captain Parker and the men and men of Lexington got their revenge. After the British column had headed 
east of the ambush point by Captain Parker and the Lexington men, they were in pretty bad shape. And by the time they made it just east of Lexington at about 1.30 in the afternoon, they came up to the relief column headed by Sir Hugh Percy, General Sir Hugh Percy. And they rested just east of Lexington at Monroe's Tavern. Now Percy had the foresight to bring a couple of cannons with them, and so they were a much more formidable force than the 600 Redcoats who now were bloodied and exhausted after their morning's work and their evening's march. After about an hour and a half to two hours of rest at Monroe's Tavern, they moved on eastward to Charlestown. And along the way, the uh, ambushes continued. But Percy did a pretty good job of keeping the Minutemen at bay, but still the number of wounded and killed kept piling up. By the time the British got back to Metomini, they were in a killing mood, and there was a, a, a great deal of urban fighting going on in Metomini, and that was where the most vicious fighting of the day occurred. Well, the British then continued on. They decided to continue along into Charlestown so that they would be under the guns of British warships, and it would be a safer route for them. And thus ended the, uh, the long march back, the running battle of six hours after the expedition had departed from Concord. What was the upshot of this day? Well, let's go into the individuals first. First, with uh, General Thomas Gage. What happened to him? This was a failure for him. And Bunker Hill was an even bigger failure for him only uh, two months later. And, and so he was, he was eventually relieved. His wife, Margaret, however, she, she was suspected of giving information to the Americans in the first place. And so Gage, uh, in the summertime, sent her back to England to his family estates. And their once very intimate marriage became very estranged and uh, the two were never the same again, apparently because Gage believed that uh, she had betrayed him uh, by keeping faith with her country. Margaret lived on well into her 90s, although Gage died around 1787. Dr. Joseph Warren, who was the head of the Committee of Safety in Boston and one of the leaders of Sons of Liberty, attended the Battle of Bunker Hill. He was given the rank of general at Bunker Hill, and Despite his rank, he decided to take the arms of uh, an ordinary private and fought at the redoubt during the third wave assault upon Bunker Hill. And he was shot between the eyes and killed during that engagement. Paul Revere, who was an obscure re revolutionary until the poem by Longfellow, uh, continued in service during the course of the war. He wound up outliving both of his wives and 11 out of his 16 children and uh, survived well into his 80s. William Dawes eventually moved to Worcester and continued in service during the Revolution, but he uh, passed into obscurity because nobody wrote a poem about him. Dr. Samuel Prescott would go on to the expedition at Fort Ticonderoga where the cannon removed from Ticonderoga we were brought to Dorchester Heights around Boston and were used to force the British out of Boston. He would then join uh, the crew of a privateer which was captured by the British and he would be imprisoned in Halifax, Nova Scotia and then die in prison based upon the harsh conditions in the prison. During the Revolutionary War about 8,000 Americans died in combat on the field but more than 20,000 Americans would die at the hands of, at, of the British in the British prisons because of the incredibly severe and inhumane conditions which prevailed in the British prisons at the time. Captain John Parker, after he got his revenge, would succumb to tuberculosis in September. And that poor fellow uh, had done remarkable duty to his country in a very short period of time, and he should be remembered for it. Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith was shot in the thigh at Parker's revenge, and he gave up his horse for more severely wounded men to make it back to safety. He was a decent man, but he was a man of no particular accomplishment, which 
is the primary reason why he was promoted over time to become a major general in the British Army. Major John Pitcairn, who did not keep his troops under control at Lexington Green, also fell at Bunker Hill. He was one of the leaders of the third wave against the redoubt on, on Breed's Hill, and he died within minutes and yards of where Dr. Joseph Warren fell. And so the two of them shared similar fates at a similar time in a similar place, although both from completely opposite points of view. General Sir Hugh Percy did not get along with General Howe, who was the replacement for General Gates. And so he left America in 1777 not to return and became one of the wealthiest people in all of the Kingdom of Great Britain. And he lived happily ever after. When, but what about the Minutemen? All the unsung heroes of that day. Over 15,000 men eventually converged upon Boston after the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Those 15,000 men became the force at Bunker Hill as well as the force outside of Boston that on the 3rd of July of 1775 would become the core of the Continental Army when George Washington rode up from Philadelphia to take command of the forces there. They were the ones who would stick it out over eight years of a horrible war and earn the independence of the United States. All these brave men demonstrated that courage matters, commitment matters, sacrifice matters, and all of that in the great abundance that was demonstrated on that morning in April of 1775 was necessary in order to give life to the last best hope for human freedom on the face of this earth, the United States of America. That's our episode for today. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. God bless you.